The overwhelming feeling in Europe today is one of disarray. Where are we heading to? Who is taking the lead? And the rapid succession of crises, what we call the, the multiple crises, with the Greek word, the polycrisis, uh, has dramatically increased that uncertainty. And the multiple crises, I mean the crisis of banks, of Eurozone, the economy, terrorism, refugees, Brexit, and I even tempted to add Trump. So this increased dramatically uncertainty. And objectively speaking, there is nothing going wrong. And we can even show results of our policies. Our economies have been growing since 2014. Last year, we, economic growth in the, in the Eurozone was even higher than in the United States. The average in the Eurozone this year is at least 1.7%. At least Five million jobs have been created in the Eurozone since 2014. Five million jobs. If you had said this in, 2000, in 2012, nobody would have believed you. The massive migration via Turkey stopped almost completely. Until now, international trade is still very open and protectionism is avoided. The number of protectionist measures, of course, is increasing since a few years. And global trade is growing slower than world GDP, but overall, we avoided outright protectionism. And with the exception, of course, a big exception of the Middle East, we have never had so few wars in the world and so many democracies. And yet, people are anxious and are expecting, expecting the unexpected. Is it based on hard facts? on real threats? Is it a perception which is out of proportion? What's going on? There are no acquis in history. History can repeat itself, but never in the same way. And the demons of the past can always come back to haunt us. And that's why nationalism, nationalism of different kinds, has to be combated. With this, I don't mean nationalism as a synonym of so-called patriotism. It's absolutely normal to be proud of one's past, culture, or language. Everyone has to belong to something and to somebody. We need an identity, and something that what is not rational doesn't exist. I add, one can chase away what's natural, but it will return at a gallop. An identity is natural. But two sorts of nationalism are dangerous. The outward looking and expansionary nationalism for which current borders are not sacred. And it happened in Russia. Or the inward looking one leading to isolationism and protectionism. And both can be inspired by feelings of nostalgia for an imagined glorious past, which, by the way, will never come back. Most of us thought that borders were an old-fashioned idea. Kurnenas mentioned it. That technological optimism would shape the, shape the future. And we were wrong. Nationalism is on the rise in all parts of the world, very clearly among the permanent members of the UN Security Council. And I can mention all the five of them. Until now, we have been able to avoid protectionism, and as I said, an outright war. So let's not panic and fall into the trap of pessimism or despair. But we have to remain cautious. And we have to ask ourselves, where does this tendency of folding back on oneself come from? What are the root causes of this new phenomenon? And much can be explained by the tension between space and place. I borrowed this couple of words from a Jesuit, French philosopher, de Certeau. I'm a, a pupil of the Jesuits, so you, you forgive me. We created a space 
in the EU single market, with its through mo free movement of goods, services, capital, and persons. You had the globalization of economies, but not only of economies, of information flows, of communication, of tourism, of migration. And all this created a new world full of opportunities, but it is also a process of creative destruction, named after the famous Joseph Schumpeter. When there are more losers than winners, if there is a perceived imbalance, or when people fear a future threat, they tend to dislike this space and long for a place where they can feel more secure, more at ease and at home, I'm referring to the title of this seminar, more protected. And we have to find precisely a, a new balance between, on the one hand, our open societies, pluralism while respecting fundamental values, our open democracies, free and fair elections, even inside the Union, and open economies, free and fair trade. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, protecting people. Protecting people against unemployment, insecure jobs, climate change, financial st instability, excessive inequalities, terrorism, illegal migration, social, commercial, and tax dumping. By the way, this new balance between openness and protection can be the core of a new narrative for the European Union and its member states. Those who are afraid are, according to Thomas Friedman, the famous American columnist, the wall people, ready to build walls in order to prevent others from coming in. Walls in their head, walls in their heart, even physical walls. The other are web people, embracing globalization, which is pros and its cons. So you can have space and place you can have web and wall. You can also put in another way, a new balance between the movers and the stayers at home. And sometimes you can even say between young and old. This analysis is valid for all Western countries on both sides of the Atlantic. Those who are only blaming the Union have too narrow a view of what is happening in our world. This tension between space and place is also a problem of the member states, not only of the Union as such, not only of the EU and its member states. It's a problem for the, of the Western world. And as I said, it is also a problem for the member states, and the Union, in that respect, is the sum of the member states. If we cannot find a new balance between openness and protection, the latter will turn into protectionism. Protecting, if we, if we can't protect people, it will turn into outright protectionism. If we cannot provide results on the protection agenda, even our democracies, our open societies are under threat. There are results, of course, and I mentioned some of the results, but not enough to regain trust. If we will not perform better on, on protection, Populism is only at the beginning of its rise. Populism means nationalism. And for them, let us not forget, never forget this, democracy is not an aim in itself. It is only an instrument to conquer power. It is not enough to say that the programs of populists are not realistic. They aren't. But anger and desp despair don't take account of this aspect. Breaking the status quo is a sufficient reason to vote for radical parties. So Trump and others have to adapt dramatically uh, the, their program to reality. But in his case, he's so unstable that he can even reverse his last reversal. Never forget or don't forget that the populists want to be 
popular. Politically speaking, a lot of people are on the left wing concerning the economy and on the right wing when it comes to security and identity. And this mix is the hard core of populism. This mix of nationalism and socialism. I will not use this abbreviation. I'm convinced that non-democratic regimes face similar problems, but they only come to the surface at the occasion of revolutions, such as the implosion of the Soviet Union or the Arab Spring. The European Union has to deal with this internal problem. Brexit is, of course, linked with this societal malaise, although the UK has always had a special relationship with the European Union, not being a member of the Eurozone or the Schengen area and having many opt-outs. It is the least integrated country of the Union. It's not surprising that populists all over the world welcome Brexit. The Union has another challenge in the field of social cohesion. How to organize a living together in a multicultural society? And this is, again, not only a European problem. The United States and other countries are struggling with the same question. It is the hard core of populism in Western Europe. I make a difference between civilization and culture. The first refers to institutions and rules, the second to immaterial factors. Ours is a unique civilization built on political democracy, the rule of law, separation between religious organizations and the state, gender equality, non-discrimination, fundamental freedoms. A compromise is not possible on those key public values. European societies are value-based, as is the United States. But many different cultures, religions, and convictions can gravitate around this unique civilization. Those two components, civilization and culture, make a living together possible. We are not there yet. Our societies are still seeking the right balance, and finding it is of the utmost importance for social cohesion, for stability, for giving everybody a place, and for reconciling space, migration, with place, with a home. A project of relaunching the European project has to take this agenda of openness and protection into account. At the level of the member states and of the Union as such, we have to give answers to the, the threats, so-called threats related to prosperity, fairness, and security. An ambitious new program for the Union has to tackle the heart of the matter and cannot be restricted to a traditional socio-economic agenda summarized as jobs, jobs, jobs. It has to deal with economic growth, but also with its distribution, not only with the economy, but also with identity. We have to, to rethink political answers. I give you two examples. The traditional social question mainly focused on poverty, how important this still is, but ignored the worrying developments within the group of middle incomes and their prospects. This is a new social issue. Speaking about income distribution, there are two kinds of inequalities. In Southern Europe, inequalities are the result of high unemployment and austerity. Identity issues are playing a much lesser role in that part of Europe. Inequalities in Western Europe and in the Anglo-Saxon world are related to the rise of profits. It is much more clear in the Anglo-Saxon world than in the countries with the so-called Rhineland model. For instance, in the United States, wages not following productivity since 1973. That means that you have a tremendous rise of profits if wages are not following productivity. In the UK, now for a median worker, 
his level of income is 7% below the pre-recession level in real terms. So we have rising inequalities in some parts due to unemployment. In other parts, even with full employment, as in the UK and the US, uh, due to other reasons. Another example of the shifting political agenda. Jobs are getting more unstable, while people yearn for stability. Empowering men and women via education, via training and formation, can provide more stability in a changing world. Stability is a component of place. And the implementation of all this is the responsibility of all levels of power. In each part of the agenda, we will need a stronger European dimension. So it is a collective effort that we are facing. There is no room for a standalone to overcome those challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, Brexit is an attempt of a standalone. And I will not uh, discuss the topic of Brexit in all its components and aspects. But just a few uh, words on, 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 let's say, on, on, on the strategy uh, for the coming, the coming months and years. First of all, a provo provocative statement. I borrowed it from a good friend, and he's a diplomat, so I can use it. Brexit is of strategic importance for the UK, but not for the EU27. There was a union before UK, UK membership from 1950 to 1973, almost a generation. And there will be one, a European Union, after 2019. However, it is a political amputation of the first degree for the union. The fifth economy of the world will leave us, and in a few decades, the most populous country of the European Union. And the most important thing, the Union is no longer an irreversible project. At the same time, Britain is the least integrated country of the Union, as I said. The UK can leave easier than any other EU country, although it remains a Herculean task. For a Eurozone country, it is almost impossible to leave the European Union. The financial markets would react violently and make even a withdrawal almost impossible. Brexit is not high on the political agenda of the EU27 leaders and citizens. They have other priorities and worries. A lot of countries are focused on their national elections. But even in normal times, Brexit comes after jobs, migration, terrorism, taxes, and so on, on the priority list of national leaders and voters. In some way, Trump is a bigger concern for EU citizens than Brexit. A lot of people feel an uncertainty growing regarding the direction in which the United States and the world is currently moving. The word war has come back in our vocabulary. The negotiations on the divorce will start after the summer. They will last a maximum of 18 months on the separation. And the separation itself is a difficult issue. Because it is an unprecedented process. In all other negotiations, in all other free trade agreements, one has to converge and to harmonize. In Brexit, we have to manage the divergences because we shared a single market. Completely the opposite exercise. It is difficult because there are doubts about the sense of compromise. And we need a compromise. The EU is surprisingly united, very strict on the four freedoms, in a definitive regime and in the transition after the exit. And it is, it is united on the guidelines for the negotiations. The EU's unity is a key objective, as well as the unity of the Conservative Party is a key objective for the British government. But when you need a compromise, you need to give up or take risk, the risk of this unity from both sides. We need also lucidity. 
Each part will defend its own interests, which is absolutely normal in negotiations. Of course, they will look for common interests. But interests are not only economic. Brexit was not a decision based on economic interests. The country made a, a choice against its own prosperity. The EU doesn't want and shouldn't want to punish Britain. But it does not want to encourage further possible exits in the future. In any case, a free trade agreement will bear costs for Britain and will be less advantageous than full access to the single market. As I said, I will not embark on, on the Brexit negotiations uh, themselves, but the process can derail. A unilateral withdrawal of the UK is not excluded, which would create huge economic problems on both sides. It's, by the way, a violation of the treaties with legal consequences. And derailing can take place at any moment of the process, during the secession negotiations, on the terms of the transition, absolutely key, on the FTA and even on the political agreement due to the ratifications we need in all parliaments of all countries unanimously. But I hope that after the exit and an FTA, a broader friendship agreement, as suggested by the European Parliament, can be concluded, covering many other domains of cooperation between the EU and the UK. In the long term, and now speaking more as an academic than as a politician, in the long term, nothing is irreversible. Absolutely nothing. Not even Brexit. Certainly, when we look at the mentality of the younger generation. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the impact of all this on the European Union? External threats are bringing the 27 member states closer together. Often you need an external pressure. I am referring to Brexit. I am referring to Trump. I am referring to Putin, an unexpected trio, by the way. The biggest challenge for the Union comes from inside. I am convinced that populists will not be in power in any of our 27 member states. I said this six months ago. I was almost accused of being naive. At my age, it become difficult uh, to say this. Uh, but the only Western country where there is, where the populists are in power, is the United States. Brexit enhanced even the support for the EU membership in almost all the countries. Does that mean that there is more Euro enthusiasm? No, not at all. But the support for EU membership increased dramatically in almost all the countries. In all Eurozone countries, an overwhelming majority is still in favor of keeping the Euro, also in France, also in Italy. A huge majority, more than 70%. Populists are even adapting or will adapt their discourse on that issue. Again, a populist want to be popular. Never waste a good crisis can be a motivation for the 27 to relaunch an ambitious European agenda. There was already a need before Brexit and before Trump. The unity of the European Union is showing on Brexit is remarkable. As I said, the guidelines were approved without real problems. And of course, divergences will appear once we discuss a free trade agreement. But it will also be difficult to manage divergences at the other side of the channel. In my view, and I said this months and months ago, France and Germany have to take the lead after the formation of their new governments. It shouldn't be an agenda of the good old days. The world has changed dramatically, and our societies are on the move. And I repeat it for the second or third time. We have to find a new balance between, on the one hand, our open democracy, societies, and economies, and on the other hand, much more protection for the people in several domains, as I said, in domains as security, fairness, and prosperity. And this agenda is a task for the European Union as such and for its member states. In the new agenda for the EU, 
We have also to tackle the missing links in the architecture of the economic and monetary union. We did a lot, but we have now to finalize the banking union, deepen the economic and fiscal union. But France, Germany, and the 25 have to overcome the traditional taboos, a loss of sovereignty and more solidarity. If the resistance comes from both sides, those who are fearing a loss of sovereignty and those who are asking for more solidarity, forget it. Forget it. So we have to overcome those taboos. If France and Germany can't, then we really have a problem. The stability and growth pact has to be refined, making it more transparent, creating space for investment, and assuring a level playing field between the member states. We have to work on a stronger military dimension of the Union, spending more and spending better. A better repartition of the roles among our armies and much more cooperation in the field of military R&D, procurement, capacity building, etc. There is now more readiness in our societies to improve our security and our defense after what happened on our eastern and southern borders. The EU27 has to go on with free trade agreements. Hopefully, we can have an agreement this year with Japan. It would be great. We have finalized negotiations with Vietnam and signed one with Canada. Actually, the EU has agreements or is in the process of negotiating agreements with all the partners of the late Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership, which President Trump dropped on the very first day in office. We have agreements with all of them or are underway. Of course, we have to enhance the level of support for an open economy in our societies. The disadvantages are often much made more visible than the huge hidden advantages. Our prosperity owes a lot to free and fair trade. We also have to, to further deepen our single market on a sectoral basis, in energy, in the digital, in services. There is still an untapped potential for growth and for jobs. Legislative work is in progress, but we have to do, we have to do more. The agenda of growth, jobs, and competitiveness is almost forgotten in the storm of the last years. Also because growth picked up, but a lot of work has still to be done at the level of the member states, especially to boost investment and innovation. We have to continue our climate change policy with its new ambitious targets for 2030, minus 40% greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990. We were or we are successful in meeting the 2020, 2020 target, so we, keep, we kept our word. The EU will work more closely with China in the absence of the United States. We have to deepen the Schengen zone by better protecting our external borders, which we are doing, and working on a more common asylum and migration policy. The Commission recently made proposals. The Schengen zone and the Eurozone were built, were conceived for normal times, not for facing the biggest financial crisis since the 30s and the biggest influx of non-EU men and women since centuries. So if we, need, if we need reforms, it's absolutely normal, because they were designed for normal times. Ladies and gentlemen, we know the menu. We even know the recipes. We only need the political will to find the right balance and the right level of ambition. Leadership will be key. We shouldn't have a deficit of leadership. We all often speak about the democratic deficit, but we shouldn't have a leadership deficit. Let me add a comment on the upcoming agenda of the EU, the controversy on a so-called multi-speed Europe. In my way, it's superfluous controversy. We already have different speeds foreseen in the treaties. The Eurozone and the Schengen area, two pillars, not just two problems, two pillars of the Union are striking examples. Not all member states belong to them. In the same treaties, a format of enhanced cooperation is made available for those countries which want to integrate or cooperate more. It only was used twice. 
The rule should be unity as a rule, flexibility when unavoidable. If other member states want to join the forefront, they have the possibility to join at the same conditions as the leading group. And by the way, recently we had only a complaint of those who fear to be aban abandoned. So implicitly, nobody wants to leave the Union. The European Union is, European Uni idea is more resilient than many expected. During my time in office, the end of the Eurozone was, according to large parts of the Anglo-Saxon press, written in the stars. The discussion was about when this would be happening, before of after Christmas 2012. That is no more than four years ago. The refugee crisis would bring down another pillar of the Union, the Schengen Zone. There are a few cracks in the system, but it remains largely intact. After Brexit and with the Dutch and French elections in the pipeline, the pessimists believed that the Union itself was on the verge of collapsing or implosion, implosion. We are not there yet, is an understatement. On the contrary. The French elections showed that one can win with a program and a rhetoric of hope, of openness, and you can win with European convictions. That's the big lesson of what happened on Sunday. So be courageous enough to defend the European idea. You saw President Macron uh, coming in the, in the, on the stage in the Louvre uh, on the tones of the European anthem. The last time I heard it was on Maidan in Ukraine, in Kiev. Uh, and not, not, even not really exaggerated. For me, it was a strong signal, a strong signal of hope, even if I have to say that I don't underestimate the problems and so on and so on. But when you say something positive, hopeful, and when something hopeful happens, then you have to apologize. Apologize. Because it's not politically correct anymore to be <coughs> hopeful or to be positive. But I repeat that there are no acquis in history. And that collectively a nation can make dramatic mistakes with consequences they don't expect or can foresee. We have to ha work hard to reconcile citizens and, and, and national and, and European, uh, uh, European politics. We have to reconcile citizens with national and European politics. We had enough warning shots. We need a sense of urgency. Now, in my view, after the French elections, there is a breathing space. Let us use it to the full. Thank you so much.